that from year to year, we always have new and better organizers for this seminar. So this year we have two postdoctoral students who we organize together the seminar, the seminar. Ariel, Ariel is doing his postdoc with Chaim, and he also works in collaboration with Leon de Ruel uh, on real hard issues, I would say, of uh, free will. So it starts with a debate, good uh, subject for a seminar, and uh, Anna from uh, Benny Proctor Lab works on, I believe, connectomics, a functional connectomics with the octopus. Connectomics is a buzzword, good word for a seminar. Okay, so we expect from you that the last seminars will be given by you. Uh, Ariel and I, we organize the seminars. I believe that all the program for the first semester is already set and done. Uh, if you have very special guests, we can uh, uh, arrange, uh, organize special seminars. But please come with advice and ideas for the next uh, semester of seminar. And without further ado, I would like to invite Ariel to present today's speaker, uh, Professor Joel Ra, who will give us a seminar about the evolution that was seen. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Yoel Rach as the opening speaker of the Thursday LSEC ICNC uh, uh, seminar. Um, Yoel Rach teaches anatomy and human evolution at the uh, Sackler Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University, which he joined after uh, completing his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Since his PhD, he has devoted most of his research efforts to understanding facial anatomy and the masticatory system in the homonese record. For the last 20 years, Rock has been engaged in field work in the Hadar region of Ethiopia and in Israel at the Neanderthal sites of Amuz and Kebaba. Kebaba. By, integ by integrating an anatomical, anatomical approach with functional morphology, Rock hopes to gain deeper insights into human taxonomy and phylogeny. Uh, Rock holds the Igor Orenstein chair and, and in 2008 was elected to the Israel Academy of Sciences. So today we're going to see from where we came from, Mehain Banu, maybe in the end we'll see where we're going to. But the topic of the talk will be the halfway mark on the road to humanhood, a look human brain evolution. Hey. Well, thank you for your kind words and, and, uh, and the opportunity to open the seminar. Um, well, you know, two years ago, we were celebrating, it's more than two years ago, we were celebrating uh, Darwin's uh, birthday and uh, 150 years, and uh, 200 years, and uh, 150 years ago, the publication of his fantastic book, The Origin of Species. And there were a lot of uh, superlatives and everybody was talking how, what a great contribution and things like that. I was, I was wondering how shall I, you know, how shall I start my lecture? And uh, I wanted to do also uh, to uh, present Darwin with, with another superlative, um, and it so happened that in one of, my, one of these endless flights from here to there and all this, I saw a movie, um, the new version of the Pink Panther. Okay, it's not recommended. It's, it's really not a good movie, but I was, you know, staring at the, at the, at the screen and... Uh, and uh, I saw the Inspector Clouseau coming into the to the murder scene, and he saw uh, he saw the the poor chap lying on the floor uh, within this uh, white uh, drawing, you know, on the on the floor. And he asked his he asked his assistant, "How come he was murdered and fell right into the into <laughs> the?" So, well, I think, and that's the best thing I can tell about Darwin, he actually told us, you know, how to look at things. And there is, there is really no doubt that he would, 
he would uh, solve uh, Inspector Clouseau the problem, okay? Because he did, he did it for all of us. And uh, so this is uh, three years ago, Darwin and, and his contribution, and, uh, and it's really not only a contribution, but it's a, a, an enormous uh, revolution. I uh, start my lectures with a, with a figure here. I have a new pointer. I hope it won't perforate <laughs> the screen here. Um, I start this, uh, the, my lecture, all my lectures with this gentleman here. It's not Darwin. And, uh, not what? <laughs> and, uh, it, it is, uh, a great uh, a biologist and uh, Darwin's great, maybe greatest supporter. And because of his tremendous uh, reputation, he was a great help uh, at the beginning, you know, to establish, uh, especially among scientists, um, the validity of uh, Darwin's claim. This is the German, the German biologist, geologist, and embryologist, uh, Ernst Haeckel. And why do I start with Ernst Haeckel? Um, first of all, because he was a great supporter, supporter of Darwin. But this is really not, not the reason. Haeckel did something very unusual. He, he actually gave a name to a creature before it was discovered. This is, this is unheard in biology. And uh, when we try to understand what, what actually is behind this very unusual uh, uh, procedure, we see that, act, that, that uh, Haeckel actually uh, did a prediction. And why a prediction is so important? Because a prediction can be can be, uh, can be proposed only in a scientific theory, okay? And if indeed, so goes the, the prediction, if indeed Darwin is right, and we and the chimpanzees, we share a common ancestor, he thought it's the orangutan, but today we know it's the chimpanzee. If indeed we share a common ancestor, then, the way the prediction goes, the deeper we go into geological strata, the deeper we go into history, we should see, if indeed Darwin is right, that the two modern forms, the chimpanzee and modern humans, will slowly, slowly give up their, uh, their ana the modern an anatomical appearance and as we go down, then they will gradually um, blend or merge into a common ancestor. Not only that he proposed uh, this, this uh, uh, prediction, but he actually gave a name. He gave a name, um, a formal scientific name, he called it Pithecanthropus alleolus, which means uh, Pitek is, co is, a, is a monkey, and uh, Anthropus is human, of course, and Aleolus is speechless, okay? The, split, the speechless uh, uh, human monkey creature, but something like this. So not only, okay, this is... Uh, so th this is this is the prediction how the prediction uh, goes. If indeed these two forms, the modern forms, uh, share a common ancestor, the deeper we go, we actually should merge in a, into a common ancestor, Pithecanthropus. Not only he gave a name. But he actually instructed a very famous, uh, a very famous painting, and he uh, he asked him, uh, instructed him how to how to um, depict uh, Peter Cantopus. And we can see. I, I always I always uh, uh, tell the story that she, for some reason, she looks like Brigitte Bardot with the very with the very. Uh, uh, 
sexual lips and, and very uh, uh, blonde hair and all this, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that somebody is laughing because the young generation, they don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, and uh, historically, this, this picture is really something um, that I can spend two hours talking about it. It's really fascinating from the history of science point of view. We can see here this gentleman barely standing upright, and he's leaning on a tree to stand upright. And we can see the jaws are very uh, protruding, and brow ridges are enormous, and, uh, and the forehead is inclined almost horizontal. But the point that I would like you to, uh, uh, to remember, and, and I would like to draw attention to it, is that when we measure the length of the arm and compare it to the length of the, of the leg, we see that they are the same. Why is it so important? Because ever since Darwin and the moment he proposed his, his theory, everybody was aware of the fact that a chimp has longer arms and shorter legs. We, we have it reversed, okay? We have longer legs and shorter arms. And there was a fantastic debate. What actually happened? Did the arms got uh, longer and the, and the legs shorter? Or all kinds of proposals. And you, an echo to this debate we see in these, in these proportions. They are even. And I would like you to remember this, this uh, uh, drawing here, and because we'll, we'll talk about it later. The, the last thing I want to point out here is if you look at the, at the foot of this lady, you can see that it looks more like, it, it looks more like our hand rather than our foot. And you can see that the big toe is actually opposing all the rest uh, all the other toes. This is the chimpanzee, and this is what we see in many, many other animals. Now, we know today that the chimpanzee is the closest to us, and we are talking about 1% different in the DNA, and I could, I could bore you to death, you know, by showing you these long sequences and here it is uh, similar and the other, and here it is different. I, I chose two, actually two pictures, just to show you how fantastically humane this figure is. And uh, this is something, this kind of relationship between the mother and, and the offspring here, you cannot, you cannot find, not in gorilla, and not in an orangutan, and certainly not in a pig or, or all the other uh, animals. Just, uh, I would like to pay uh, to uh, draw your attention to the to the length of the hand. Okay, almost as long as the baby itself. The other picture is uh, I got it from National Geographic. This is a this is a chimp that. Uh, that uh, died, unfortunately, and is carried out from, uh, from the protective uh, enclosure in Gabon. And I, I would like you to look at the, at the faces of, these, of, these, of her friends, okay? Some are uh, faces that express horror, some fear, and some amazing, amazing, uh, wandering, uh, all kind of expressions. This is, again, a scenario that you will never see among gorillas, okay, or orangutans. These, the, these two pictures tell us, really, if we don't, if we don't uh, go to the DNA, uh, how, how very close the chimpanzees are uh, to humans. But these, these features that I was pointing out obviously cannot be uh, quantified. And in order to establish the exact relationship between us and the chimps or the gorillas and the orangutans, 
the DNA is, of course, the best tool. I mean, there is really no better tool to, to express differences or similarities be, between animals. Uh, the chimps and, chimps and humans are so close, uh, so close together, uh, which means only one thing. Because they are so similar, it means that the common ancestor was not living, was living not far away from the present, simply because the, the difference is actually a function of time. And I don't know how many of you uh, know the, the, the amazing fact that we and the, and the avocado, or the pineapple, if you, if you like, we share a common ancestor, okay? But intuitively, everybody will say this common ancestor was, and indeed he's right, this common ancestor lived many, many, many years ago. Today, and I don't have time to go into this, but today we know that the, 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 the genetic differences or the accumulation of mutation and all this is actually accumulating in a very constant rate, especially uh, the DNA that is called neutral. You know, a year ago I would call it junk, but apparently it's not junk anymore. Okay, so, uh, so the neutral DNA and the, the, the vast majority of, of the genome is actually uh, ticking almost like a clock. And there, there are ways to calibrate the, the rate of, of, uh, of uh, the sticking. And we know today, or at, lo at least it was proposed when I was a student in Berkeley 35 years ago, and a little bit before, it was proposed that five and a half million years ago lived the common ancestor. This was a tremendous, tremendous shock because and I don't know the reason why, because it was, it was uh, agreed upon everyone that the chimp and human, they share a common ancestor that lived 25 million years ago, and some say even 30 million years ago. And suddenly ca come uh, Wilson and Serich, the teachers of mine in, in Berkeley, and they proposed that it was five million years ago. And the, ama the more amazing thing is that until today, okay, this date is solid. Some will say between five and seven, just to be cautious, and, and there are some problems with the, with the molecular clock and things like this, but the date is five million years ago. <coughs> now, this is very important because I'm going to concentrate on fossils that are three and a half million years ago. Three and a half million years ago, it's, it's, about, it's about midway between the common ancestor and the present. How do they look like? And what, what can we learn from them? They are fascinating fossils. In the last 20 years, I myself am involved in an expedition to, to, to a place called Afar in Ethiopia, and I'm going to show you some of our uh, discoveries. This is the place of the famous Lucy. I'm sure so most of you heard about Lucy. And just before leaving this, uh, this slide, I, I would like to draw your attention to another important thing is that the, the very simple family tree that, I, that is drawn here is symmetrical, okay? In other words, if Darwin is right, as the prediction goes, both human and chimpanzee will go, will, will, will uh, give up mutually, will give up their, common, their uh, modern, uh, uh, modern appearance, modern anatomy, and will merge to something that is not a chimp and not a human. And I'll come back to this point. It, it is a crucial point. Okay, so 
what, we, what, what do we do? We start with the present, as, as the prediction goes. And it is very well documented. Okay, we start with Homo sapiens, the brain capacity 15, 14, 1500 uh, uh, cc. We see a very primitive face. Uh, bra uh, the brow ridges are gone. We can see that the, that the forehead is steep. And this is, hopefully, everyone is bearing this kind of skull on his, on his neck. A chimp, on the other hand, has only a third of this brain capacity, 500 or 400 cc. You can see that the brain capacity, of course, determines much of the, topo of the topography of the skull. And we can see that the forehead is inclined because of the minute brain capacity. And because of this inclination of the forehead, there is a very distinct, there are very discrete, discrete brow ridges protruding and very prominent. You can see also that, and, and this is a point, we'll come back to it later, you can see that the teeth, okay, they are actually um, um, uh, interlocked, especially the anterior teeth are interlocked, the, the upper and the lower together. As we go down, okay, and I'm sorry, and in order to sum summarize the, the big differences between the chimp and the modern chimp and modern human, you can see this is the chimp, very small brain capacity in comparison to uh, Homo sapiens. On the other hand, we can see very protruding jaws on, in the front of the face and very a very modest and uh, shrunken uh, masticatory system that is c uh, very typical of uh, modern Homo sapiens. Now, I'm going to talk about brain, about brains, and, uh, and obviously brains, they, they are not fossilized. Skulls are fossilized. And I'll start with, just to, dem just to show you some examples, this is a very famous uh, baby from South Africa, two and a half million years old, and uh, it's called the baby from Taung. And when, when we look at the baby on a side view, you can see this is the permanent, the permanent tooth uh, just coming in, so it's about five, six years old. The, the, the skull is represented, the, the actual skull is represented here only in the front, and all the rest, the skull is gone. But what is left here is actually the fossilized mud that occupied the, the, the brain case when the baby was lying in some kind of a cave. The, the brain case itself is gone, but an imprint of this brain we can see. We can measure the, obviously we can measure the, uh, the brain capacity, and we can see fantastic details including, including uh, the middle meningeals and, uh, and the uh, vein drainage, uh, venal blood drainage, and the acetabulum and cerebrum, and, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, cerebellum and and the, and the brain and everything. Sometimes nothing is left except this endocast. And you can see, I mean, I don't know how many of you saw uh, human brains in, in the dissecting room, but, but you can see it's, it's almost as, as if it, it was taken from a cadaver. <laughs> the middle meningeals, the confluence of sinuses, and the and, uh, parts of the brain and, and proportions of the brain. We are talking about a, a tiny little thing that is only 500 cc, and so on, and so on. So this is, this is the modern human skull, very steep and upright uh, forehead, no brow ridges, 
and because the because the teeth are actually shrinking so dramatic, I'm sorry, the dental arcades are shrinking so dramatically. We and we are the only one left with a protruding nose and with a chin. Okay, because everything in between these structures actually sunk into the face. So if we go, and I'm, go I'm, I'm going to take you into this jo journey here, uh, and Israel is playing a, a really major, uh, major part in the, in the very late uh, section of human evolution. This is a skull uh, about 100,000 years, or homo early Homo sapiens. You can see the original, a very unusual practice uh, uh, in Rockefeller Museum. You can see still brow ridges, enormous brow ridges, but there is a chin. And as we go down, uh, this is a beautiful cave. This is the Sea of Galilee, and this is the outlet okay, of, the, of uh, Wadi Amud, recommended, uh, really a very nice place. And in 19, 1925, this skull was discovered, we don't know exactly how old it is, but it's certainly around 200, maybe uh, even, uh, even uh, uh, older. This is the very famous, uh, very famous skull from uh, the cave, the Galilee cave, and, and this is known all over the world as the Galilee men. And when I was a, a young student in Berkeley, I was asked to give a lecture about something significant in in uh, in Israel and I to the to the general public and I I chose to to talk about the Galilee man and its significance and to my horror I saw a lot of priests and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, nuns sitting in the audience and I realized that they came to hear about a different Galilee man okay <laughs> So this is a Galilee, the Galilee, I'm talking about the fossil here, this is, uh, you can see, even though it's really uh, very, very little of the skull is, is, uh, is preserved, you can see n enormous brow ridges, the, the forehead is already inclined, and it's much more primitive than the last one. And we go down, this is, a, this is a fam another famous skull from Germany, Steinheim. Again, the brain is rather big, but it's getting smaller and smaller, okay, as we go down, okay? It's getting bigger and bigger as we go up. Steinheim. And then we come to Homo erectus, the famous Homo erectus. You can see br enormous brow ridges. The brain capacity is 800, 900, sometimes 1,000. And uh, the Homo erectus is all over the world. And recently, well, it's about four or five years ago, uh, in Georgia, uh, Gruzia, a, a, a fantastic site was discovered. I cannot, I cannot express how fantastic the site is. I don't have the time. But you can see a, a, a complete skull with enormous brow. This is 1.8 million years. I was, I was lucky to, to be invited to study this. You can see a tiny skull, enormous brow ridges, and the brain capacity is about 600 and even less, 600 cc. You can see it here and here. And uh, when, we, when we scale the two skulls, modern humans, and this fantastic uh, new discovery, you can see quite, and they are, um, they are uh, drawn to a, to a fixed scale, you can see quite big differences. And we can see very clearly a very small brain capacity, but very protruding, very protruding snout. And we go down, and now we are coming actually to the domain that I am I'm so uh, fond of, and I, I am, uh, I'm busy in the last 24 years uh, 
a surveying and excavating. This was uh, this is the Afar site, uh, the Afar site in northern Ethiopia, at the border between Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Djibouti. It's a deadly desert today. And uh, the, 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 the amazing thing is that these were actually a, a, a geological sediment of a fresh water at the bottom of a fresh water lake, an enormous uh, lake. And uh, what I would like to draw your attention is to this, to, to, to this white line that is running for miles and miles and miles. This is actually a, 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 a volcanic ash that after a big eruption actually sunk also into the, uh, the lake, the bottom of the lake. This is a very important element because we can date the volcanic ash. We cannot date the fossils themselves, but the volcanic ash we can date. And very interestingly, and we noticed it, you know, as soon as, as uh, we, we were introduced to this region, that above this line, there are a lot of flakes and very primitive tools. Underneath, there is really none. Okay, that's very interesting, because everything underneath, in terms of fossils, Lucy and her relatives come from underneath. What came from above here, we had no idea, but they were they were producing tools, at least tools that we can we can uh, see, and and they preserved. They are preserved unlike, say, a, a wooden stick or something like this. These are a, a, a flint, no, I'm sorry, stone tools. And you can see some of them, very simple. I'm sure everybody says I have in my backyard millions of them. <laughs> but you can see that there are, there are pebbles, okay, pebbles that few flakes were uh, removed in order to produce something uh, very sharp. There is a debate if this is the tool or maybe the flakes or maybe both, but there is really no doubt that ab above a certain level, the, these are the, the uh, evidence of human activity, and there are a lot of them. Underneath this line, this is, this is really where our main interest lies. And we walk, you know, for weeks and weeks looking for fossils that are actually eroding out. And you can see here very clearly that some of the fossils are very impressive. The beginning was very modest. You can see here a fossil, three and a half million years old. The, these are slides that goes to my dissertation, and uh, and I just I just put it. This is the back of the skull. I put it I put it next to a chimpanzee, and they are the same. They are the same. Both of them are 500 or even less uh, cc. Both of them because the, because of this very small volume. Both of them they have a shape, the bell shape of the skull as you look at as you look at it from the back. And even if you go with a magnifying glass and check some uh, anatomical details, you can see the scars of the, of the masticatory muscles both of the, in both the skulls. They reach the, the, the top of the skull. This is, it's, not, it's not the condition that we have it. And obviously, I mean, if it, if it would be a less formal lecture, somebody would jump and ask me the obvious or the inevitable question, how do you know you didn't find a chip? Okay, so they look so much the same. Uh, that I, I would like to point out some very significant, uh, significant differences. What you see here in a, in a posterior view you can see that all the nuchal area, all the nuchal area is exposed, 
And there is a forum, the forum in Magnum, I hope everybody knows the forum in Magnum, is actually facing you, okay? Here, all the nuchal area is underneath and the forum in magnum is actually facing downward. And the reason is very simple, because here the, the vertebral column is running parallel to the ground, and here it's perpendicular to the ground. We are talking about, at this stage, three and a half million years ago, we are talking about uh, chimps that are walking upright. Okay? Chimps that are walking upright. Okay, this is my drawing, and you can see the, the whole idea. Uh, this is the nuchal area, and this is the nuchal area in human. By the way, the skulls, both human and dog or whatever, they are fixed in their orientation because of the semicircular canals and the sensation of gravity and the line of, uh, the line of uh, uh, horizon and things like this. They have to be fixed. So everything stays the same, but the vertebral column is uh, changing dramatically. Again, these are slides uh, from my dissertation, and you can see I, I just uh, took advantage of the fact that the fossil here, again, three and a half million years old, was broken here right in the middle. I, I just sliced a, a, chim a modern chimpanzee uh, skull, and you can see you put them together identical, okay? Look, look at this, for example, the, the central incisors are enormous, then there is a very small, very small, uh, or, uh, or a very large reduction in the size of the lateral incisor and so on. But even here it is the same thing. But even here, I would like uh, to draw your attention to the fact that here there is a very a large gap. There is a gap here too, but it's not so big. And why do I make such a big fuss from a very small gap here? Because it actually, it's, it's actually an indication to a completely different, a completely different mechanism of chewing. In a chimp, in a chimp, okay, as I already pointed out before, the, 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 especially the canine, the upper and the lower, they are actually interlocked in both, in both jaws. This is the reason why we need the gap. In human, all the teeth are on the same level and there is really no interlocking, and this is the reason why we can chew a chewing gum, okay, from side to side. If you give a dog a chewing gum, don't do it, but you can see, okay, that he, he's not getting along with this. Okay, so this is very important. And when we look, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't help, uh, and I took a photograph, this is of course an ad, Maybe they understand something about kosher uh, hot dogs, but they don't understand about biology because this lady simply couldn't close her mouth. <laughs> so when you look, when you look at, the, at the fossils, and still I, I'm, I'm just pointing out and I'm introducing you to, the, to very small fragments, but, but they are significant. You can see that there is a little a little bit of this interlocking, but it's not functional anymore. It's on the way, okay? Not that they have a vision in mind, but it's on the way to become a, a hominid, okay? To become a, a masticator system that is more similar to us. I mean, Darwin in his, in his uh, wildest dream couldn't imagine such a sequence. We have a human canine, a chimp canine, and a miracle, really, how we found it. Uh, you have a canine of these, of these uh, creatures. We call, them we call them Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, in short, we call them afarensis. 
three and a half million years, halfway between chimp and human. Yeah, a little bit. That's that's uh, especially with the canine, but 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 still. And this is this is a, a good friend of mine, uh, Don Johansson, who found Lucy, the famous Lucy. And I have to rush a little bit. This is Lucy itself. Okay, you see, it's a miserable-looking skeleton, but we we were very excited after this this was found. First of all, because it confirms, okay, uh, because, of, because the pelvis was found, that we are talking about a biped, something that is walking uh, upright. There was no skull, but never, there, there is a mandible, but nevertheless, there is a representatives for the arms and to, for the leg. And you don't need high-tech uh, devices all, all that has to be done is to measure with a ruler and to realize, unbelievable, that the proportions of legs versus arms are actually even, exactly like this fantastic imaginary painting from, from the beginning of my talk. This is Lucy next to a six-years-old uh, lady and we are talking about the females are very, uh, it's a meter and about mit, meter and 15 centimeters, the height. So they are very small. I'll skip this. And I would just say that it took about 20 years of very intensive work because Lucy, as, as, as you realized before, Lucy didn't have Okay, it didn't have the, uh, the skull. And our main effort was concentrated to find the skull. And this is the skull that was find, found in, in, um, in 1992. And you can see we are talking about something that really looks like a, like a chimp. Really looks like a chimp. I, I have to brag about it. I found it. And when I saw it, it was lying upside down, okay, so the, the base of the skull was facing me. And when I saw the foramen magnum and the rest of the anatomy, it was unbelievable. To see a, to see a chimp anatomy with the foramen magnum, this big hole, not in, not in, a, not in a chimp position. It was really a very exciting moment. I'll show you, and time is getting uh, uh, short, but I'll show you, this is another one, it's not, uh, well, it's, it's published, but not, uh, uh, not widely. Uh, th this, is a, this is a rock that, uh, that is called uh, DD3. It's a sand rock, and for some reason, underneath the sand rock, we find a lot of these hominids. And sure enough, uh, a few years ago, one of our, uh, one of our workers, an Afar person, found a single tooth. They have guns and they shoot in mid-air, you know, and everybody's running, and, and we realize immediately that there are a lot of other elements from the skull rolling on the slope. Really, this is a, te this, this scenario is, is really from a, from a textbook of geology. The next, and we collected, of course, everything. The next one is going to disappoint you. It looks like a shakshuka, you know, with all these little things. But after, after, uh, after about, uh, two months in Addis Abeba, you can see this is what we have here. And this is, this is in the middle of, of being assembled. Okay, this is a side view, a chimp, really a chimp. And we have the male and we have a female and an enormous sexual dimorphism between them. And even 
uh, also recently we we not not our expedition but uh, uh, our neighbor neighbors they found a baby that is about three years old a national geographic that supports us uh, all these years of course uh, like these scenarios you, you see you see upright chimps that are walking uh, that are walking uh, almost like us big sexual dimorphism between us between the males and the females and we have a lot of information okay so what May. They have such yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucy and uh, and yeah, we are we have about almost uh, 70 mandibles today. Okay, we don't have skeletons, but we have 70 mandibles that actually uh, teaches you that this is the range in terms of size. But here we come, and I still have time. Yeah, uh, here we come to a very a very important question. Okay, I was talking about midway. Okay, chronological midway. Everybody, uh, everybody understands. But it turns out that the morphological or an anatomical midway is a very loaded uh, issue. Because what do we mean by midway? I mean, brain capacity is like a chin, but they walk like like humans. Is this the midway? Or a midway is some creature that walks, okay, halfway between a chimp and a human, and the brain capacity is 700 cc, okay, midway. It's a very, uh, it's a very intriguing and very loaded question, and we realize, okay, that not all the systems, not all the biological systems. They evolve in the same rate. We call it, we knew it, you know, in, the, in theory. We call this phenomenon, we call it mosaic evolution. And contrary to what Darwin actually speculated, he thought that brain capacity and walking upright and freeing hand, they are actually going together. He was wrong. On this point, he was wrong. We know today for a fact that brain capacity evolved many millions of years, okay, many, many years, actually millions of years after complete bipedality was achieved. And so, so in terms of systems, we have, for example, the brain capacity is still in stasis, nothing changed. In terms of uh, uh, locomotion, they were walking like us. In terms of, uh, of uh, uh, masticatory system, they were halfway, okay? But not all the systems are evolving at the same rate. <coughs> now, uh, lo and behold, it's our neighbors, unfortunately, that are about 150 kilometers south to us because of the inclination of the, of the geological layers, they are fortunate to excavate and to look for fossils that are about four, four and a half and five million years old. And they were the lucky ones, and it was published in uh, 2009, this is the birthday of uh, Darwin, and you cannot imagine a, a more beautiful present to present Darwin than this discovery. A whole issue of science was dedicated to this discovery. And <coughs> you, don't, you don't need to be a big anatomist to realize, and I didn't mention it before, because we do have evidence in, uh, in uh, afarensis. Lucy walked like us with the, with the toe exactly as ours, okay? It wasn't converging. It was, she was walking very much like us. 
the fact that the toe is arranged along the long axis of the foot is of major biomechanical uh, importance because this is actually what what pushes you and and it causes you to fall down with every step. Now, four and a half million years ago, all you have to look at, at the cover of, of science and to realize that at this stage, it looks like a chimp and barely walked upright. Okay? Barely walked upright. We have also the pelvis. The pelvis is really between Lucy's and a chin. Okay? So fantastic is the discovery. The skull is even more primitive than what we have in Lucy. This is already, I pointed out, the converging, diverging toe. And the pelvis. This is the, this is the creature. They gave it the name uh, uh, Ramidos, okay, uh, Ardipithecus Ramidos. Really, the most exciting find in in recent years. I would like to go back to the diagram that uh, that we were uh, you were uh, presented with at the beginning of my talk, and I insisted to point out that we are talking about something that is symmetrical. There is really no doubt today that evolution is not as perfect and is not symmetrical in its progression. There is really, when you think about it, there is really no reason even to expect because these two branches are, are actually independent identities. Okay? They have nothing to do with, with each other. And with, with, an, with a symmetrical configuration, you are actually talking about one is depending on, on the other. There is really nothing like this. There is really no doubt that the common ancestor that we are all th thriving to discover, Ramidos is here, and we are very close to, it, to the common ancestor, so again, there is really no doubt that the common ancestor is very much like the modern chimp. In other words, that evolution is, is actually not symmetrical in all the branches. And it shouldn't surprise us, because this is actually the explanation why we have fish today, even though we evolved once from fish. And we have Frogs, salamandras, more. I mean, uh, 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 th these are the these are the creatures that are more important to us. The salamandras are still in existence, even though we went through them. So the whole the whole animal kingdom is actually asymmetrical, and all these branches are eventually reaching the present. Not all of them. The majority of them didn't. So I'm going to talk about brain capacity, and, and I, I hope I demonstrated, just one second, I demonstrated that brain capacity during human evolution is actually slowly, slowly uh, uh, increasing in volume. <laughs> It turns out in recent years that brain capacity is a, it's a very loaded uh, concept. There is a lot that is going on in small brains, and there is very little that is going on in big brains, and you cannot actually uh, use this very old icon of saying big brain you know, equals intelligence. And, the, and we have some example. I think I know what you, are, you want to ask me. Is this something to, related to this? You wanted to ask something. I, I want to ask, so 
isn't there an apparent contradiction between the how how the prediction of uh, when was the common ancestor uh, and this and the asymmetric evolution? Well, there is no. The, the, the yeah. prediction was based on. Okay, uh, so the, the prediction the prediction that w we should correct the prediction that some of the branches okay, some of the branches they do converge to the common ancestor, but the common ancestor doesn't change. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry, the, that the common ancestor is actually maintaining in other part of the, of the tree maintaining its primitive condition. And how do we know it? Okay, how do we know it? If let's let's assume for a second that the modern modern anatomy of the of the chimp today is the result of let's say the last million years. Okay? If this was the case, how can we explain that so much of the an, so much of the modern anatomy of the chimp is around the corner at this point? Okay? Unless we assume that the common ancestor was actually very similar to the chin. There is, if you, if you draw this line, there is a bend a little bit lower, and there is another bend, and there is another bend. Okay? Did I answer? What is the basic assumption of timing? The, I, we thought that the timing came from... Oh, that this is, yeah, this, thank you, because... We are talking about two different things. This is called in biology the, 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 the big divorce, okay, between genetics and morphology, okay? There is really no doubt that the molecular clock is producing a, a, a very symmetrical tree, okay? Because the, the clock is very constant in its ticking. But the morphology is a different story, okay? So, it, so, so the difference in genotype between yeah. modern chimpanzee and the, the ancestor is the is same. Different. Is the same between us and me. That's right. But That's right. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't clear it up. Yeah. No. There is there is a big problem. We, we, we didn't find chimpanzees, but we found orangutans, okay? Uh, there, there is a big problem with the habitat of chimpanzees. They live in a jungle or very close to the jungle, and uh, uh, every, every corpse is, is undergoing a very intensive erosion there, okay? And this is why. So, so actually... Actually, what we, what we are actually claiming is that the moment we are out of the, jung of the jungle, there is a chance to find the fossils. And indeed, that's what we see, okay, in terms of paleo habitat. Um, so I said that... Okay, I said that... Uh, there is really uh, there is really uh, little left from this very old-fashioned concept about brain capacity and how much uh, it it actually tells us. About uh, ten years ago, I, I don't have the date here. Uh, on an island in Indonesia. 2004. 2004. So. Uh, so, uh, in an island of uh, Indonesia, and it, it was uh, really the, the, the cover of nature, very small, very small uh, hominids were found. This is, uh, this is apparently related to what is called ecology of islands, because in an island, and we know it for many, many other uh, species, there is, there is an average in size. Okay, so with, with these hominids that are the, the size of meter, one meter, we find rats that are the size of a meter. Okay, and elephants that are the size of a meter. Okay, meter, one, one meter uh, big. 
And the brain capacity, even if we correct for, uh, for stature and, and the size of the animal, the brain capacity is tiny, tiny, tiny. Okay? Nevertheless, there are tools with, the, with, these, with these hominids. Very surprising, and, and the, the first sign that in hominids, uh, not always, you see, this is, this is the Lilliputs, and this is just an ordinary homicide. This was the first sign that even within hominids, we have, we have a lot of uh, variation, and I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about within population, but between population in size, and it's not necessarily as simple explained as we always used to do. Okay, uh, I'll just show you. This is, this is a National Geographic reconstruction, and you can see the rat is as, as tall or as long as the human itself. This, uh, uh, this fact was already suggested in sociobiology by many, and I remember, again, this goes back to my, uh, my time in Berkeley, uh, this, is, this is a dog, and this is uh, just a rodent, a, a squirrel. And uh, it was shown many, many times that if you, if you chain the dog and you pass the chain through a, st a, a stick heel, he won't be able to figure out uh, how to reach the food, even though, even though the brain of a dog is as a, as a carnivore, is much larger than the rodent. On the other hand, if you, do, if you, if you challenge the, the squirrel with the, same, with the same test, you will see that he will solve it in a second. Okay? He will solve it in a second. Simply because evolution uh, provided him with a different perspective. He, he's living on trees, and it's very important for him to figure out all these little things. Okay? And uh, since time is getting uh, short, I, I would like to point out, maybe most of you know it, um, in science there was an uh, uh, article about brain uh, the brains of birds, and apparently birds, they have a tiny brain, even in, in proportion to their, uh, to their size, but it is a very sophisticated brain. And I know the anatomy of the brain, and to read it, it was really fascinating. With the supplementary material came a short movie, and I'll finish with this, happening here. Okay. Okay, this is uh, probably most of you. This is a raven trying to trying to pull out a basket with food in a cylinder in a cylinder of uh, glass, and he cannot do it. He has a wire, a metal wire, and look, look what's happened here. Okay. It's, it's almost, looking at it, it's really spooky. <laughs> and, and since I know the anatomy of the brain, you see that there is a lot going on in what we, what we call the volume of the brain. Thank you.
Well, uh, there, there is really no doubt that uh, my dog doesn't understand how the engine of my car works because he has a very small brain, okay? Because his brain is small? Yeah. Why do you think that the size matters? Well, <laughs> obviously he doesn't understand what's going on there. But not necessarily because he's small. What is it? Not necessarily because his brain is small. <laughs> yeah, I know. There are, there are always some people say, well, I don't understand. Uh, anyway, what, what I'm trying to say here, and, and we are very, we are confronted with this issue, and it's, it's becoming very obvious that size by itself of the brain is really not, not the answer for everything. And all you have to do is to go to the computers uh, with, with, their, with a different architecture, you know, solving uh, with a ver very small core, solving much, much uh, uh, complicated uh, problem than the old computers, okay? So this is, this is the only analogy that I can, uh, that I can uh, uh, recruit. about much more recent history, but is there any uh, evidence about the morphology in relation to the evolution of language? Well, uh, the, the, is, the issue is, uh, is very interesting, and uh, Dawkins, Dawkins uh, proposed something uh, very simple, and, uh, and of course, when, when I read it, I say, oh my gosh, how I didn't think about it and all this. Evolution, uh, human, human brain, um, the capacity of human brain, evolves uh, in a very peculiar way uh, through a, a long part of, of hominid uh, history. It, it's increasing, but, but like the increase in, in the animal kingdom. And about two million years ago or so, some say a little bit less, suddenly we see that the brain capacity is taking off and, and actually diverging in a very dramatic way from the regression line that is, uh, that is uh, in a, on a slope. And he proposed something very, very uh, interesting. He said, he said that apparently human in the, in the history of human, we, we, we kind of got engaged in a, in a, in a struggle between software and hardware, very similar to what uh, in arm race, he was talking about an arm race that is very similar, and this is his uh, example. We all know that we buy a new computer because all, because all the, the software is already old. By the time you get it, well, today it's much faster, but by, by the time my kids get it and install it and got, get the new software, you already need to change the hardware, okay? And this is, this is actually the, the arm race that he's talking about. In other words, the hardware is the brain, and the language, according to Dawkins, is, is actually the software. And the moment, the moment these two things are got into an arm race, there is the acceleration. We don't know, I don't know, any other reason for this very, very peculiar uh, behavior of the graph. Yeah.